Shermer, the director of the Skeptic Society and the publisher of Skeptic Magazine. We are hosting a special on Carl Sagan with the uh, publication of his two biographies by William Poundstone and Key Davidson. And uh, we're going to spend the hour discussing uh, Carl, his life, and, and what it means. And so I got to thinking uh, about this whole subject of what is the measure of a life when it is gone. Uh, an obit in the newspaper, a short story in a magazine, a tribute from family, friends, and colleagues, a potted television biography, 500-page book. How should we capture the essence of that life? A list of accomplishments, highlights and lowlights, interviews with family, friends, and colleagues, and a few critics thrown in for good measure, a womb-to-tomb narrative. And if that life was extraordinary, a life of greatness, an epochal creating life, how is a contemporary biographer to put that life in perspective when the epic is still going on? What tools should we use? Oral history interviews, demographic and statistical compilation, document analysis? What field should we consult? Psychology, sociology, cultural history? Does the measure of a life depend as much on who is doing the measuring as it does on the measured life itself? Or can we actually get to the meaningful core of a person? Can there be a science of biography? Well, I was reading Barbara Tuckman's book, uh, A Distant Mirror, and she had an interesting statement at the beginning of this book about the convolution of history. In fact, how contradictions are a part of life, not merely a matter of conflicting evidence. She says, I would ask the reader to expect contradictions, not uniformity. No aspect of society, no habit, custom, movement, development, is without cross-currents. Starving peasants in hovels lived alongside prosperous peasants in feather beds. Children are neglected and children are loved. Knights talk of honor and turn brigand. Amid depopulation and disaster, extravagance and splendor were never more extreme. No age is tidy or made of whole cloth, and none is more checkered fabric than the Middle Ages. That's beautiful Barbara Tuckman writing. But we can apply this to a single life as well. No life is tidy or made of whole cloth, and none is more checkered fabric than Carl Sagan's. One problem with narrative biography is determining whether a description of one's subject by a colleague, a friend, family member, represents a long-term personality trait or a short-term temporal state. Was Carl Sagan a tender-minded liberal, or was he a tough-minded careerist? Was he a feminist? or misogynist? Was he really obsessed with the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligence, or was this just a passing fancy that happened to generate a lot of media attention? How can we tell? The problem is, is if you start off with the hypothesis, it's easy to mine the data to find quotes and examples that fit what you're looking for to slant a particular history to go in one way or the other. Now, the dream of a historian or social scientist is to have it all in one place to look at. And fortunately for us, Carl Sagan was almost obsessive with keeping track of everything he did. Most curriculum vitas are you know, 12, 15, 20 pages, 50 pages. This is Carl Sagan's curriculum vita. <laughs> it's 265 pages, single space typed. So I mined the data, not to test any one hypothesis, but just to kind of look at a, a life uh, with, from, from, from some statistical points of view. So you could start off with something simple like this. Uh, these are Sagan advisory groups, professorship, lectureships, professional societies by type. I'll just get this one right there. Uh, total 293, 137 advisory groups. This is anything from um, you know, a board of advisors for like Skeptic or the Humanist or whatever to professional groups, lectureships, professional societies editorial positions, patent designs, uh, 26 short biographies, and now two full-length biographies, and they're both here today. We can look at uh, Carl Sagan fellowships, awards, and prizes by type. Won quite a few, total of 89. But, but, what, but what did he get them for? That, that matters, because what was it that was important to him that people rewarded him for? Number one, humanitarianism, humanism, and peace. Uh, this is all the environmental stuff that he worked on, nuclear winter, and so on. Uh, popularization of science and education, which he's probably most famous for. Uh, his scientific research, outstanding overall achievement, 13 of them. Only two for scientific writing. However, numbers don't just 
just say it all, one of those two is the uh, Pulitzer Prize. So <laughs> that's not so bad, I think. We can look at uh, honorary degrees by type. You got honorary degrees, a number of them. In fact, 23 total, 14 a doctorate of science, and so on and so forth, 23 total. I, I should note that, um, that, that these statistics only really matter in context. I mean, one of the questions I was interested in is, why was Carl not nominated to the National Academy of Science? How would he compare to other members of the National Academy of Science? Well, I call the National Academy of Science, I call the AAAS, and they just don't have that kind of data. Other people do, and I just didn't have time to, to put all that together. But, so what I did was I called three prominent, eminent scientists, all members of the National Academy of Science, you all know who they are, Jared Diamond, Ed Wilson, and Ernst Meyer. So by comparison, Sagan has 23 honorary uh, doctorates. <clears throat> um, Ed Wilson has, uh, let's see, Ed Wilson has 26 honorary degrees, which he was happy to tell me. One of the, uh, <laughs> one of the characteristics of a, of, of a great man, is, of a driven careerist, as it were, is you keep track of your statistics. I mean, Pete Rose and some of these fanatical baseball players, they're, they're, they're famous for this, and, and, and a 265-page curriculum vitae is a great example of this. Uh, Wilson knew right off the top of his head, uh, yeah, 20, you know, 23 for him, I, I had uh, 26. When I talked to Ernst Meyer, Ernst Meyer's 95 years old. And uh, <laughs> so he's had a few uh, 35 years more than Carl, 34 years more than Carl to accumulate these things. Nevertheless, he said, I only have 16, but mine are the cream of the crop. <laughs> My doctorates are from Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and Yale and Bologna. He said, and you know Bologna is the world's oldest university. Okay, okay Ernst, I got it. Uh, I mean, these guys, you know, they, they didn't get to where they are by being a uh, lack of self-confidence. Um, we can look at books. I did a content rating of Carl Sagan's books. Uh, I mean, what's he interested in? What's he writing about? Planetary science, the most, 10. He was a planetary scientist, first and foremost. That was his most conservative thing that he did. Uh, but Exobiology and the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, eight books. General Science, six. Nuclear War and Environment, five. Two on evolution. Uh, I should say that 12 of these were solo authored. The other 19 are co-authored. Uh, so Sagan was very good at, uh, at working with other people and sharing uh, ideas and, and data. Oh, I, I should just put my comparison here. Um, Ed Wilson has 23 books, nine solo author, eight co-authored, six co-edited. Ernst has 21 books, 13 solo authored, and four co-authored. But Ernst was quick to tell me that one of them was 900 pages long. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And I'm telling you, at 95, he did not have to go to his notes to uh, <laughs> explain this to me. Uh, Sagan Scientific Articles by Content, 500 publications, 67 publications in Science or Nature. Science and Nature are the two most uh, prestigious journals. When you go to the www.science.com and look at their criteria for what you should consider before you submit your paper, they ask you, is this the most important thing you've ever done? Is this the most original work you've ever done? And if you told nobody about the results, then you can consider sending it in. All right? 67 of those is not bad. Uh, I, should, I should note that this includes abstracts, uh, which is a little unfair. The, my other guys, Jared Diamond and Ernst Meyer and Ed Wilson, did not include abstracts in their CV, and they felt that was a little bit of a cheat. So when we actually do the comparison, and by the way, I'll, before I put that up, planetary science, again, number one, a priority in his scientific publication, almost double uh, uh, the second one of exobiology at 158. Said, I broke out exobiology from SETI as two different things. Most of the exobiology papers are having to do with, uh, with the origins of, um, chemical origins of life, things like that, not extra, actual intelligences. And then 16 papers on nuclear winter and nuclear war. So clearly, again, he's a uh, highly regarded conservative planetary scientist. He's not out there on the fringe. Uh, like that at all. Now, when you compare it to the other guys, um, Carl in context, Car uh, career scientific publications. Car I took out the abstract, so that puts him at 412, compared to uh, Ed Wilson at 380, Jared Diamond at 549, and Ernst at 704. And Ernst knew immediately, as of today, 704. <laughs> um, the uh, 
the, the rate of publication, oh, I think I forgot to print out my, uh, no, I have it here. Uh, the rate of publication is slightly different. Jared's, no, I, I didn't print that out. Jared's is uh, actually the highest if you do uh, publications per year, because Ernst's 95 and Jared's is 55. So uh, Jared's comes out at 13.4 a year. Carl's is 10.3. Uh, Ed's was 7.2. So Carl's certainly in the, in the ballpark of the most eminent scientists today. Not the highest, but, but, but it also shows you what a highly regarded scientist uh, Jared Diamond is as well. Uh, if you look at his, this was quite an interesting thing. This took me almost all day Saturday to do this. This was Carl Sagan, Popular Articles by Content. Forget that. It's 1380. It's a typo. 271 was the, the highest one. The, the most written about thing by Carl in non-scientific publications, these are just um, magazine articles and so on, is uh, SETI and space exploration. That was his true passion. Not, not just his scientific passion, but his personal passion there. And there it is. The data speak for themselves. Actually, the number two most common thing written about was Sagan himself. Uh, 263 interviews or profiles of Carl and or his wife, uh, Anne. And then uh, nuclear war in winter is pretty close to that, as well as social commentary. I broke these out. Environment and nuclear war is one. Social commentary is like women's rights, abortion rights, free speech, things like that. Uh, and then all the way down. See, exobiology is quite small compared to, to these over here. So again, that gives us a feeling for where his interests lie where he vested a lot of his time. Carl Sagan, scientific popular articles by year. Question is, is, did he lose scientific credibility and productivity after Cosmos and becoming such a productive popularizer of science? The answer is no. And you can see it in the data. Here's the big spike, Cosmos airs, whoop, number of popular articles. But the, the pace of his scientific production continues throughout. I mean, there's little fluctuations throughout, as there are in all careers. And there's a little dip just before 1980, because, of course, when you're producing a 13-part series for PBS, there's no time to actually do the research. So there's not many papers coming out just after that. But, but he gets back on track. So uh, he was accused of being a mere popularizer and not doing real science. Not true. There it is. And these are, all, and these are peer reviewed. And again, science and nature are in there uh, prominently. Finally, uh, I wanted to look at um, Carl Sagan's personality. Again, if you say you know, he was a tough-minded careerist, or was he a tender-minded liberal supporting women's rights, what, what, what was he? Well, one way to answer that question, and I'm going to kind of go through this quickly, uh, but this will all be in the next, my next essay in Skeptic, uh, in which I sort of look at all this in a little more detail. Frank Soloway and I, Frank is here, a social scientist, uh, wherever Frank went. Uh, where'd you go, Frank? <laughs> oh, there he is, back there, Frank Soloway. Uh, thank you for coming, Frank, from uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, Frank and I did a mailing to uh, a bunch of Carl's family members, uh, friends, colleagues, and asked them to fill out this, uh, this is what's called the Big Five Personality Scale. What we're asked, measuring is conscientiousness, agreeableness, openness to experience, extroversion, and neuroticism. And they were to, ask, they were to answer the question, I see Carl Sagan as someone who was, and then on a scale of one to nine, not dutiful, dutiful, trusting, suspicious, interested in the arts, organized, disorganized, and so on. These 40 adjective pairs then are reduced down to these five different personality uh, dimensions. And then from that, you correlate them. And then you correlate the raters to see the consistency between the raters. I mean, if, one, if, if, if they're scattered all over the board, he was liberal, he was conservative, then what can we say? But the correlation that Frank ran for me on these was a 0.74 correlation between the raters, which is, in social sciences, that's plenty high, that's respectable, that's enough, that we can say something intelligent about Carl Sagan's personality in context of the large the population at large, which Frank uh, Soloway has a database of over 7,000 people on his computer. So we just, we just rank Carl by his raters compared to uh, his personality for example, on conscientiousness, he's at the 88th percentile of the general population. Very high in conscientiousness. Very low in agreeableness. Okay? Uh, so he's tough-minded. Uh, he'd rather be right than nice, I guess would be one way to say it. Uh, he's willing to stand up and, and uh, uh, you know, for what he believes to be true. He can be hard-headed, th that kind of thing. Uh, the other significant one was quite interesting, 97th percentile openness to experience. Wow. I mean, to be a pioneer in a science, in, in a field, you really need to be open to experiences. These, these two are not particularly significant, although in neuroticism there is the, the compulsiveness uh, component, and I think that's probably pretty high as evidence <laughs> of this as data. Uh, I should note, too, in that, in that 1,380 popular science, 
articles are included. Um, articles not about Carl, but about a subject in which he was interviewed. And when I told that to Jared and Ed and Ernst, they just groaned. They, they would never include something like that because uh, it's not something he wrote and it's not an interview with him. So I think those, that spiked a little bit high, but of course that's a product of being famous. You get called a lot. But the actual keeping track of it is a clue for us about his personality. This is somebody who is really a hard-nosed careerist, and he's keeping track of all the data, everybody that called him and so on, and had somebody to help him with that. So now, in the context of his particular revolution, his search for extraterrestrial intelligence, I did this search, Carl Sagan, in context with the SETI pioneers. There's a book called The SETI Pioneers, uh, in which uh, some of this data was collected. The birth order data was collected. I then got the rest of it through the book and some other sources. Let me break that down for you so you can actually read it. Carl in context, the SETI pioneers. You'll see an interesting development here. This is birth, uh, birth rank and total sibship size. First, first of two, first of two, first of two, two of two, but older sister, so firstborn son. First of three, second of two, but again, firstborn son. First of two, second of two, again, firstborn son. First of two, only child. Second, first of two, two of seven, one of seven, one of two, only one of three. Now. The author of this book makes the observation, isn't that interesting? There seems to be a, a preponderance of firstborns in the SETI movement. But he, but he never asks the obvious next question. Is it significantly greater than what you would expect in any other population? Which, so by itself, it's completely meaningless. But thanks again to Frank Soloway, there's an actual test you can run, a statistical test, and you figure out what this population size is, you know what the general population size is, the average rate of firstborns and so on, and you do the calculations, and it turns out this is statistically significant at the 0.05 level. It's not as good as 0.01, but still it's statistically significant that this is more firstborns than you would expect by random chance at a statistically significant level. Now, so what? What's going on with firstborns? Well, as Frank shows in Born to Rebel, uh, those kinds of personality characteristics, uh, conscientiousness in particular, and that tough-mindedness as measured in this sort of low agreeableness, are typical of firstborns. But what about this openness to experience? Well, firstborns are just, the birth order is just a proxy for other things going on. For example, if you have high conflict with your parents, then you're more open to, then you're, then you're more like a later born than a firstborn. Carl didn't have high conflict with his parents, got along great with his parents. His mother loved him, adored him, and that's a big part of the biographies. It's fascinating. Um, so what else is going on? Well, he's raised Jewish, and members of oppressed groups tend to be more liberal, more supportive of liberal causes, and so on. And in fact, as we saw in the statistics on the things he published, and popular articles in particular that he wrote, he was very socially liberal, extremely socially liberal. Uh, and so that would explain the openness to experience. And then the final thing, I'm not sure, and I'm still playing around with this in my mind, this whole SETI thing. What is SETI? I mean, all of these guys believe that there probably are extraterrestrial intelligences, or else they wouldn't be in that field, right? They wouldn't have been pioneers in the field. They wouldn't be working in it. But they were all asked in, in that book on the SETI pioneers, do you believe in UFOs? Not one of them. I mean, there was a tiny bit of equivocation. Oh, maybe, you know, who knows, but probably not. And, and so they, they believe in the, it's sort, of a, sort of a high class, uh, uh, high brow form of uh, of extraterrestrial, not the, not the lowbrow abduction stuff with w w crop circles and stuff like that. Um, so finally, I'm, uh, uh, I was looking at their religious backgrounds. All of these guys were raised in some sort of religious family, Church of England, Anglican Orthodox, several Jews, of course, Sagan was Jewish, and they're all atheists, all of them. Uh, well, all of them were non-believers. It was difficult to code because they didn't ask directly. You had to infer it from the interviews in this book. Uh, but they were all at least non-believers, or I couldn't tell from, or they just came out and said, I'm an atheist, and Carl was certainly pretty strong about that. Uh, so I'm speculating, and I can't prove this, but it's just sort of an interesting idea, and our biographers can comment on that if they wish, uh, that SETI is almost a quasi-religion kind of spiritual movement in a way. <laughs> Uh, there's absolutely not a shred of evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence. I suspect, like most people, that they're probably out there. But, but yet driving that is this idea that there's something transcendent to us, a higher intelligence of some kind. And, uh, and, and that they've, got to, they, they've somehow survived destruction of their environment and, and the ecosystem in themselves, and so they must be wiser than us, more intelligent than us. They're almost deified. I mean, that's what you see in these science fiction 
uh, novels and films, and it's a little bit of that in contact to be sure.